Hi everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. Tonight we are continuing with reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing with Chapter 16, Over the Hill. On Friday nights, Dad and Mother often went to a lecture or a movie by themselves, holding hands as they went out to the barn to get foolish carriage. But on Saturday nights, Mother stayed home with the babies, while Dad took the rest of us to the movies. We had early supper so that we could get to the theater by seven o'clock in time for the first show. We're just going to stay through one show tonight, Dad told us on the way down. None of this business about seeing the show through a second time. None of this 11 o'clock stuff. No use to beg me. When the movie began, Dad became as absorbed as we and noisier. He forgot all about us and paid no attention when we nudged him and asked for nickels to put in the candy vendors on the back of the seats. He laughed so hard at the comedies that sometimes he embarrassed us and we tried to tell him that people were looking at him. When the feature was sad, he kept trumpeting his nose and wiping his eyes. When the lights went on at the end of the first show, we always begged him to change his mind and let us stay and see it again. He put on an act of stubborn resistance but always yielded in the end. Well, you were less insolent than usual this week, he said, but I hate to have you stay up until all hours of the night. Tomorrow's Sunday. We can sleep late. And your mother will give me hail Columbia when I bring you home late. If you think it's all right, mother will think it's all right. Well, all right. We'll make an exception this time. Since your hearts are so set on it, I guess I can sit through it again. Once, after a whispered message by Ernestine had passed along the line, we picked up our coats at the end of the first show and started to file out of the aisle. What are you up to? Dad called, uh, called after us in a hurt tone and loud enough so that people stood up to see what was causing the disturbance. Where do you think you're going? Do you want to walk home? Come back here and sit down. We said he had told us on the way to the theater that we could just sit through one show that night. Well, don't you want to see it again? After all, you've been good as gold this week. If your hearts are set on it, I guess I could sit through it again. I don't mind, particularly. We said we were a little sleepy, that we didn't want to be all tired out to tomorrow, and that we didn't want Mother to be worried because we had stayed out late. Aw, oh, come on, Dad begged. Don't be spoil sports. I'll take care of your mother. Let's see it again. The evening's young. Tomorrow's Sunday. You can sleep late. We filed smirking back to our seats. You little fiends, Dad whispered as we sat down. You spent hours figuring out ways to gang up on me, don't you? I've got a good mind to leave you all home next week and come to the show by myself. The picture that made the biggest impression on Dad was a 12-reel epic entitled Over the Hill to the Poor House, or something like that. It was about a wispy widow lady who worked her poor old fingers to the bone for her children only to end her days in the almshouse after they turned against her. For an hour and a half, while Dad manned the pumps with his handkerchief, the woman struggled to keep her family together. She washed huge bats of clothes. She ironed an endless procession of underwear. Time after time, single-handed and on her hands and knees, she emptied all the cups to doors and scrubbed down the lobby of Grand Central Station. Her children were ashamed of her and complained because they didn't have store-bought clothes. When the children were grown up, they fought over having her come to live with them. Finally, when she was too old to help even with the housework, they turned her out into the street. There was a snowstorm going on, too. The fade-out scene, the one that had Dad actually wringing out his handkerchief, showed the old woman shivering in a worn and inadequate hug-me-tight, hug-me-tight, limping slowly up the hill to the poorhouse. Dad was still red-eyed and blowing his nose while we were drinking our sodas after the movie, and all of us felt depressed. I want all of you to promise me one thing, he choked. No matter what happens to me, I want you to take care of your mother. After we promised, Dad felt better. But the movie remained on his mind for months. I can see myself twenty years from now, he grumbled when we asked him for advances on our allowances. I can see myself old, penniless, unwanted, trudging up that hill. I wonder what kind of food they have at the poorhouse, and whether they let you sleep late in the mornings. 
Even more than the movies, Dad liked the shows that we staged once or twice a year in the parlor for his and mother's benefit. The skits, written originally by Anne and Ernestine, never varied much, so we could give them without rehearsal. The skits that Dad liked best were the imitations of him and mother. Frank, with a couple of sofa pillows under his belt and a straw hat on the back of his head, played the part of Dad, leading us through a factory for which he was a consultant. Ernestine, with stuffed bosom and flowered hat, played mother. Anne took the part of a superintendent at the factory, and the younger children played themselves. Is everybody here? Frank asked Ernestine. She took out a notebook and called the roll. Is everybody dry? Do you all have your notebooks? All right then, follow me. We paraded around the room a couple of times in lockstep, like a chain gang, with Frank first, Ernestine next, and the children following by ages. Then we pretended to walk up a flight of stairs to indicate that we had entered the factory. Anne, the superintendent, came forward and shook hands with Dad. Christmas, she said. Look what followed you in. Are those your children or is it a picnic? They're my children, Ernestine said indignant, indignant, indignantly, and it was no picnic. How do you like my little Mongolians, Frank leered. Mongolians come cheaper by the dozen, you know. Do you think I should keep them all? I think you should keep them all home, Anne said. Tell them to stop climbing over my machinery. They won't get hurt, Frank assured her. They're all trained engineers. I trained them myself. Anne shrieked. Look at that little Mongolian squatting over my buzzsaw. She covered her eyes. I can't watch him. Don't let him squat any lower. Tell him to stop squatting. The little rascal thinks it's a bicycle, Frank said. Leave him alone. Children have to learn by doing. Someone off stage gave a dying scream. I lose more children in factories, Ernestine complained. Now the rest of you keep away from that buzzsaw. You hear me? Someone make a note of that so we can tell how many places to set for supper, Frank said. He turned to Fred. Freddy boy, I want you to take your fingers out of your mouth and then explain to the superintendent what's inefficient about this drill, pre drill press here. That thing a drill press? Fred said with an exaggerated lisp. Haw! Precisely, said Frank. Explain it to him in simple language. The position of the hand lever is such that there is waste motion both after transport loaded and transport empty, Fred lisped. The work plane of the operator is at a fatiguing level and... Sometimes we made believe we were on an auditorium platform at an engineering meeting, at which Dad was to speak. Anne played the chairman who was introducing him. Our next speaker, she said, is Frank Bunker Gilbreth. Wait a minute now. Please keep your seats. Don't be frightened. He's promised this time to limit himself to two hours, and not to mention the one best way to do work, more than twice in the same sentence. Frank, with pillows in front again, walked to the edge of the platform, adjusted a pince-nez which hung from a black ribbon around his neck, smirked, reached under his coat, and pulled out a manuscript seven inches thick. For the purpose of convenience, he began pompously, I have divided my talk tonight into 30 main headings and 117 subheadings. I will commence with the first main heading. At this point, the other children, who were seated as if they were the engineers in Dad's audience, nudged each other, arose, and tiptoed out of the room. Frank droned on, speaking to an empty hall. When Frank finally sat down, the audience returned, and the chairman introduced Mother, played again by Ernestine. Our next guest is Dr. Lillian Muller Gilbreth. She's not going to make a speech, but she will be glad to answer any questions. Ernestine swept forward in a wide-brimmed hat and floor-length skirt. She was carrying a suitcase-sized pocketbook from which protruded a pair of knitting needles, some mending, crochet hook, baby's bottle, and copy of the Scientific American. She smiled for a full minute, nodding to friends in the audience. Hello, Grace. I like your new hat. Why, Jenny, you've bobbed your hair. Hello, Charlotte. So glad you could be here. Dressed in a collection of Mother's Best Hats, Martha, Frank, Bill, and Lil started jumping up with questions. Tell us, Mrs. Gilbreth, did you really want such a large family? And if so, why? Any other questions? asked Ernestine. Who really wears the pants in your household, Mrs. Gilbreth? You or your husband? Any other questions? asked Ernestine. One thing more, Mrs. Gilbreth. Do Bolivians really come cheaper by the dozen? 
After the skits, some Dad sometimes would put on a one-man minstrel show for us, in which he played the parts of both the Misters Jones and Bones. We knew their routine by heart, but we always enjoyed it, and so did Dad. With his lower lip protruding and his hands hanging down to his knees, he shuffled up and down the parlor floor. Does you know how you gets de water in de watermelon? I don't know. How does you get the water in the watermelon? Why, you plants them in de spring. Dad slapped his knee, folded his arms in front of his face, and rolled his head to the left and the right in spasms of mirth. Yak, yak. And does you know Isabel? Isabel? Yeah, Isabel necessary on a bicycle. And does you know the difference between a pretty girl and an apple? Well, one you squeeze to get cider, and the other you get cider to squeeze. Yak, yak. Once the show was over, Dad looked at his watch. It's way past your bedtime, he complained. Doesn't anybody pay attention to the rules I make? You older children should have been in bed an hour ago, and you little fellows three hours ago. He took Mother by the arm. My throat is as hoarse as a frog's from all that reciting, he said. The only thing that will soothe it is a nice, sweet, cool chocolate ice cream soda with whipped cream. Um, he rubbed his stomach. Go to bed, children. Come on, boss. Boss, I'll go get the car and you and I will go down to the drugstore. I couldn't sleep a wink with this hoarse throat. Take us, Daddy, we shouted. You wouldn't go without us. Our throats are, our throats are horses, frogs, too. We wouldn't sleep a wink, either. See, Dad asked, when it comes to sodas, you're right on the job, up and ready to go. But when it comes to going to bed, you're slow as molasses. He turned to Mother. What do you say, boss? Mother protruded her lower lip, sagged her shoulders, and let her hands hang down to her knees. Did you say molasses, Mr. Bone? She squeaked in a querulous falsetto. Molasses? Why, honey, I ain't had no lasses. Get your coats on, chillin'. Yak, yak. Thirteen sodas at fifteen cents apiece, Dad muttered. I can see the handwriting on the wall, over the hill to the poorhouse. And that is the end of chapter 16, and tomorrow night we will continue with chapter 17. Have a good night, everyone.